to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve as we continue our study in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 8, Lord willing, we'll go through the first 21 verses of this chapter. Uh, I started out uh, with a title. In fact, uh, I changed the title on on this message on the way here. <laughs> um, sometimes I don't get fully settled on a on a title. Titles really are kind of meaningless, uh, and at once you get started in the message, but uh, it's it should capture the essence of what we're uh, learning about. And uh, I had the. Uh, uh, the opportunity and value of wisdom, which it is, but as I thought more and more about it, um, I decided to call it Stop Diminishing the Importance of Wisdom. But that's really the issue with us, as I've uh, been just pondering. Stop diminishing the importance of, and we're talking about God's wisdom here, not just intelligence or knowledge uh, in general, but knowledge that comes through God's Word. Uh, and I, I, I call it stop diminishing because I believe that that's what we do all too often on a regular basis. Uh, what we'll find tonight in our study is, uh, as we talk about the value of wisdom uh, and the benefits of wisdom, uh, we will understand, as is oftentimes laid out here, not only in the book of Proverbs, frequently in the book of Proverbs, but generally throughout the scriptures, uh, wisdom is always ends up being compared with wealth or money or material things. They always end up being compared in scriptures. And when you start thinking about why that's true, it's because we, in our daily lives, we tend to give more importance to the monetary or uh, material things of our world as opposed to the value of wisdom that God gives to us. And how can we measure that to know that? Well, how much time maybe we spend uh, on accumulating or... Because one of the focus focus I will see tonight is the the time we spend in increasing our knowledge and understanding of the Scriptures, our wisdom in the Word. Because uh, as Peter said in 2 Timothy Peter 3.18... We need to grow in wisdom, and that means to continually increase in godly wisdom. And we'll see that in our lesson tonight, and we'll close with a thought on that that will help us in our practical application. But the importance of wisdom to us should be of paramount importance. Let's put it that way, of paramount importance. And when we think of it that way, because we get in a Bible study, or we get in a, you know, the, the study in the Scriptures, and we see the emphasis placed upon that, and then we sort of, we understand that, we sort of promise ourselves we're going to do something about it, but it just seems like it doesn't get much traction in our life for some reason. Uh, and what we need to do is, is put a priority on studying God's Word and increasing our knowledge, because increase is the key. Uh, and I know uh, a number of people who get older in life, and they don't think Bible study is important, as important anymore because they sort of spent, you know, maybe they got saved at a, you know, in their 20s or 30s, and by the time they get to be 70 or 80 years old, it's like they feel like they got it. I'm not going to get any better at it. But that's not the case. Uh, we can't cut God's hand short through our thinking processes. We need to rely upon the Word of God and understand that if we study, God will increase our knowledge. Um, and the scriptures are pretty clear that it takes effort in order for us to increase the knowledge. As I've said many times before, you can't just put a, a Bible under your pillow and by metamorphosis get it to accumulate in your mind. It doesn't work that way. Um, and it was something that was sort of, you know, I remember when I was uh, much younger, I heard that if you just take a, maybe you just take a, 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 an application or an audio tape of, of reading of scripture and put it on your bed, and go to sleep while it's playing, that you'll wake up wiser. I tried that. (laughs) Did you try that? (laughs) I never actually tried it. (laughs) 
I'm not saying it's not a relaxing thing to do, but don't expect to gain wisdom that way, <laughs> right? It helps relax you. Well, yeah, now they got the thing with the rain and, you know, music and stuff like that to go to sleep by. Uh, one of the things I've done for years, of course, I, I, I started it as a, at, and I was 21 years old getting two to four hours sleep a night. And it's amazing what it does to your life. It's amazing. Um, and you have to condition yourself to that. And once you're conditioned to that, uh, yeah, life's, life's a lot easier. Um, you know, you get up in the morning, you run about eight miles, and you're refreshed, and you're ready to go, and you don't need much sleep. But every time you get still for about ten minutes, look out, right? <laughs> There's going to be a nap coming. But anyway, let's get to the Word. We're going to start in verse 1 of Proverbs. And I'll read down through verse 21, uh, and then we'll come back and study. Uh, Proverbs 8 and verse 1 Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places, by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, uh, literally at the, uh, the coming in at, or the entrance of the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools be ye of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and of the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing uh, froward or crooked uh, for perver or, or perverse in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to those who find knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine, and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign, and princes decree justice. By me princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love those who love me, and those who seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, and durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of uh, judgment, that I may cause those who love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. Father, we ask that you would uh, guide us through your word with understanding, increase our knowledge as we study. Uh, we understand we can't receive unless you give it to us. Uh, we can't get it on our own. So as the Holy Spirit uh, guides us into the truth and provides the ability to understand it, through that enablement, Lord, where our desire and our interest is in increasing our wisdom and our knowledge and our understanding tonight, as we study your word and ask that you would be generous in giving to us from the depths of your wisdom, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. So this first point I call um, wisdom seeks everyone everywhere, literally true. Um, so it's God, you know, it, it, Peter also wrote in Second Peter that it's not God's will that any perish, but all would come to repentance. Um, so God's, God's not willing that, it's not his will for anybody to perish. Uh, so people that perish, it's not because God didn't want them to be saved or give them the opportunity to be saved. They chose not to receive Christ as their Savior, chose not to put faith in God, if you will. But before we take a look at the verse by verse, I want to, uh, if you will, uh, go back to Proverbs chapter 1 where we started. Just a brief refresher. Uh, the one thing about God's word uh, is that it, and, which is also wisdom. Wisdom is used as a word to, to as an alternative name for Christ as well, because we understand that um, uh, according to John 1:14, that the word was made flesh. So Christ is called the word. The word is wisdom, and so Christ is the word of God, and the wisdom of God uh, comes from Him uh, and through His word. But God's word is infinite, it's unsearchable, it's mighty, and it's perfect. Proverbs 1, 7, uh, we see the inception of wisdom in our life. And that's what's important because it says in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. That word beginning means inception. 
the commencement, if you will, or the beginning. Uh, it's where it starts. The fear of the Lord is the starting point of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. That means they disregard it, don't consider it to be valuable. In fact, many times detest it. Uh, you start talking about the Lord, uh, people will turn the other way and look for something else to listen to. Go back to the first verse of Proverbs 1, where it says the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, are given to us what? To know, to know wisdom and instruction and to perceive the words of understanding. Not only, if you will, to know, but to receive in verses 3 and 4. It says to receive. To know in verse 2, to receive the instruction of wisdom, righteousness, uh, and justice, and equity. To give prudence, uh, subtlety here means prudence, to the simple. Is it a simple-minded, gullible, if you will, or susceptible to error and the wrong path? Uh, but they gives prudence to the simple to the young man knowledge and discretion. And what we find in verse 5 is the increase we were talking about. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A wise person will listen to what God has to say through the reading of his word, through the, the preaching, uh, through God-ordained ministers. A wise man will hear. Man is a word that's added you see it in italics in your King James Version. That italicized word means that it doesn't appear in the original manuscripts, uh, which is the Bible, but it's given for understanding. It's implied, if you will. Literally, a wise person will hear and will increase learning. The man of understanding will attain unto wise counsel. But we will, if we listen to what God has to say, we've got to avail ourselves of time to study the word, we will increase our learning. Um, and then um, look at chapter 9 and verse 9. Chapter 9 and verse 9. And it says, give instruction to a wise... You see, again, man's a word that's added. Um, so give instruction to a wise person, if you will, and he, that is they, will be yet wiser. That's increase. It says, give instruction, uh, and instruction is italicized as well. The obvious implications of this verse, when a, when a person receives instruction, uh, that they will get yet wiser. And it says, teach a just man, that is one who is right before God, one who's had the righteousness of God imputed to them. Teach a just person, and they will increase in learning. So you see the emphasis on increase, increase, increase. Don't diminish the importance of wisdom. Now, we go back to the first verse of chapter 8. And I call this, wisdom seeks everyone everywhere. The scripture says, doth not wisdom cry? The word literally means to shout. Uh, and understanding put forth her voice. Now, what we're going to see in this chapter is the personification of wisdom. It's, it's, uh, it's set up to be like a person, if you will, personification. So wisdom shouts, shouts, and understanding puts forth... But now remember, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge are all used as synonyms of wisdom uh, and throughout the book of Proverbs. So we see wisdom here is um, wisdom, uh, it cries, and it puts forth her voice. Puts forth means raises the voice. It puts it forth, right? So shouting and raising the voice so that everybody can hear. And then it tells us about that here. It says she, uh, wisdom, is um, given uh, the, the, the uh, feminine pronoun here. She standeth in the top of high places. Because we're talking about everybody and everywhere. She standeth in the top of high places. By the way, or the path, and you could put in there, in the places of the paths, that's the paths where people go, wisdom can be found everywhere. In verse 3, uh, she crieth, or shouteth, if you will, at the gates. These are public places. Uh, in those days, there were gates into the city. There were gates everywhere. Uh, at the entry of the city, and literally at the entrance of the doors, um, the words there, coming in at means the entrance place, or the coming in at the doors. So whether they're doors or gates, all of the places where people come and go. 
because we all go. To get here, we had to come through a couple of doors. We in and out of the doors in our vehicle and out of the door of our house, right? So it's everywhere we are. We go to the store, we go into a door, unless you're shopping online, right? <laughs> um, so it's, it's really the places where we go. They didn't have online uh, shopping back in these days. Mary went to the grocery store today. She had to go in a door and out a door. So in uh, verse 4, it says there, unto you. And that really is a finger pointing at each one of us. Unto you, O men. Men is a word that means people, humankind. Unto you, O people, I call. Now you see this change. You see the she um, in, uh, or the her in verse 1, the she in verse 2, the she in verse 3. The feminine pronoun being used for wisdom and the personification of God's wisdom. And now in verse 4, takes on first person uh, personification. So we see wisdom actually speaking here. And of course, we understand that wisdom is God speaking. But it's particularly the wisdom of God that's speaking to us. So in verse 4, unto you, O men or O people, I call. Literally, I call. I'm calling everywhere. And what this means, O people, I call I saw one where one commentator called it all of, uh, all of Adam's children. <laughs> That's one way to phrase it. It's everybody, right? We all came from Adam. God created Adam, and we've all come from that. So it's literally everybody. So I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. Literally, it's to everybody. We see in verses 2 and 3, it's everywhere. In verse 4, it's everybody. And we see in verse 1 that she's crying out and raising her voice. Literally, God wants His wisdom heard everywhere. Now, what we know about God is given to us through the Scriptures. So how are people hearing about it? Point the finger itself. It's us. It's us. And it's people like us who know God, who by faith in Christ, we've been saved by the grace of God. And given that free gift of salvation, God also enables us with the fruit of the Spirit and so the, those are the enablements of the Spirit. The fruit enables us. So some of those enablements are people that preach or teach or do ministry in various forms. Uh, others are, you know, lay people or whatever it is. But we all have a witness and a testimony. And so literally, that's how God's Word is known. And it's crying out in the streets. Uh, literally, I, I get posts every day that come across my uh, social media People carrying signs and standing on sidewalks proclaiming the Word of God. I've done that myself. I've handed out Bibles for years with the Gideons. Uh, I was president of the Norfolk Gideon Camp in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, living in Virginia Beach. But what we did is uh, we'd go out on the sidewalks and we'd just give out New Testaments to people. And we, of course, you don't just hand them a Bible, you talk about the Lord. Uh, and I did a lot of street ministry where you go out and uh, I've had people that you know, put their faith in Christ on the sidewalks. Not my credit, it's God's credit. But if we would just go and let people hear, because God wants people to hear. He wants them to listen. So God doesn't throw His Bible and hit them without a person handed it to them, right? Um, and of course, we see it now in modern day technology going out through all kinds of electronic media. Literally, God has made this available everywhere. We have a, a Facebook ministry that's in 214 different countries. That's about the maximum number of countries in the world. So the word is going out, and I'm just one person, but there's a lot of people out there putting the word of God out. Some of them errantly, unfortunately. There were, there were false teachers in the day, uh, in scriptural days, all the way through the scriptures. But the word of God is going out and to everybody, everywhere. And that's the important part of this, is God just doesn't have it for a few. What we receive from God, we need to share. That's how it gets around. Now, the next point I want to make, not only do wisdom seeks everyone everywhere, but wisdom's character is given to us in verses 5 to 9. The character of wisdom. Because it says here, and the introduction to this section says in verse 5, O ye simple, notice we have simple here, the ones who are gullible and susceptible, if you will, to every, every wind of doctrine that may come. But even these people, God, a simple-minded person, is a person who doesn't have full mental full mental capabilities or natural mental capabilities are deficient in some way. And fools are just those that don't want to hear it, right? They just resist it. But for the simple and the fool, it says here in verse 5, O oh, you simple, understand wisdom. They have the ability to understand the wisdom of God's Word uh, as it's presented through whatever means God sends it to them. 
uh, as we've talked about. And ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. So we see every person starts out in one of these categories. We're either simple or we're a fool. Uh, Simple-minded, maybe don't have the capability to understand very clearly, very easily. But fools, uh, before we were saved by the grace of God, we were fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And you say, well, you know, I never said there was no God. (laughs) Well, uh, even the devil believes in God. Let's remember that. And he's certainly a fool, right? Um, So it's the fool is the one who rejects God. So, oh, you simple, understand wisdom. The simple, is, the simple are capable of understanding it if, if they're willing to and if it's presented correctly uh, and wisely in a, in a fashion that is pleasing to the Lord. And fools, be of an understanding heart. Listen. I don't know if you ever talked to a fool. I'm sure we all have. And when you talk to them, they have no interest whatsoever. They're foolish. Now, it says on in verse... Uh, uh, verse 6, it says, Hear, why? For I will speak of excellent things. This is wisdom speaking. I will speak of excellent things. And um, uh, those are the things that, are, that God considers to be excellent, not necessarily intelligent things. But God's wisdom is excellent. I will speak excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. And you see, wisdom... Everything we need is coming from the Word of God and from the Lord Himself. And so in verse 7, the first word is four. First, uh, second word in verse 6 is four. The reason for the fours is it gives us, gives us, it's a purpose clause, it gives us the reason for what was being said here. So what's said in verse 5 is um, understand, be of an understanding heart. Understand the message of wisdom. Why? Because in verse 6, I will speak of excellent things and of right things. The wisdom of God will only give us that which is excellent and right. And in verse 7, the 4 is also a continuation of why uh, everybody can understand this wisdom or uh, through the ability that God gives if there's a willingness to receive it. In verse 4, for my mouth shall speak truth. So we see excellent things in verse 6, we see right things in verse 6, we see truth in verse 7, and at the end of verse 7, what we see is the opposite of that, that is not going to be coming from the wisdom of God, and that is wickedness and evil, because it's abomination to the lips of wisdom. It's abomination to God. And we studied that not long ago, when we were in chapter 6 of Proverbs. Six things, yea, seven does, does God hate. And we see a reminder of some of those things in this passage tonight. And so in verse 8, it says, all the words of my mouth, you can trust every single word in God's word. You can trust it all. You know, there, and, and I say you can trust it, but sometimes we have selective hearing. Sometimes we have selective perception. You know, we see it and we sort of, we pick out what we think are the important things And so by doing so, we necessarily have select, by selection, have left out some things that our mind have determined are less important. How many times have you looked at a verse in Scripture and say, man, I never really saw that before? Because we're seeking wisdom, God's going to give it to us. He's not going to give everything. In fact, we can't receive everything God has for us by way of wisdom because His wisdom is is unsearchable. Literally, we can't even begin at the, at the, the breadth and depth of God's wisdom. So, uh, we're never going to get there, but God continues to open our understanding and feed us. If on day one of salvation, God, you know, we have the entire Word of God, we couldn't handle it. (laughs) So, God expects us to grow. If God didn't expect us to grow and increase, He wouldn't have told us to do that. Uh, He'd have told us, get all this stuff now, and then take it with you the rest of your journey. That's not the way it works. Our mind is, is not infinite like God's mind. It's finite. And even at that, uh, the best of sources, uh, I understand, we only use about 10, maybe 15% of our brain. Um, and, uh, but there are differing levels of that, and I haven't heard, you know, I did study physiological psychology, but in those days I haven't heard of, you know, how the increase, or somebody uses 8% of the brain and somebody uses 12%, what's the difference in that? Um, it's physiological, and I don't think anybody actually understands uh, all of the physiological aspects of people. We have medicine at its best 
in its advanced stage, most advanced stage ever, still can't, we still can go to a doctor and can't get a diagnosis of what's wrong. We can go to specialists and not even understand what's wrong. We can go do all that stuff, get a diagnosis, and it be proven wrong later. Um, and and we, can, we can get a diagnosis that tells us one thing, we could die of it you know, within a few weeks, and it wasn't even considered to be that dangerous to start with. Or it could be considered very dangerous, and yet we live a long life. So we can't really understand a human body. Neither can we stand everything in God's Word. That's just one small aspect, is the medicine and the psychology of an individual, right? So it says in, um, in uh, verse 8 here, it says, All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing... Uh, forward or crooked or perverse in them. So what we can do is trust everything God says. That's the key, though. We have to trust it. We say we put faith in Christ. That means by putting faith in Christ, we literally are saying we put our faith in God's Word. When, tell, when we receive instruction from God's Word, we need to do it. It's not optional. There are many commands in the Scripture. Many commands. We'll see some tonight. Um, and so here in verse 9, still looking at, at the character, because what we understand in verse 5 is we need understanding. Uh, and we see in verse 6 that the excellent things and right things. We see truth in verse 7. Uh, we see that evil is an abomination, is not presented to us as truth in the Scripture. Obviously, only as evil. And righteousness in verse 8, it says, All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing perverse if you will, in them. And then in verse 9, they are all plain to him that understandeth. That means they're discernible. That means that they're clear and, and, and easily understood. They are plain to him that understandeth. That's the one who, how do we get understanding? Fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, of knowledge, of understanding. That's the beginning. It's the inception. So when God gives us that word, he makes it plain to us as he opens our understanding, because our understanding has to be opened by God himself. And it says, and it's not only uh, plain, but it's right to those who find knowledge. So what we see it's clearly understood, and it is right. And one thing that we can say about God's word, it's right. We live in a world where the majority of people say it's wrong. And if they don't say the whole thing's wrong, they'll say part of it's wrong. Some of it's wrong. Most of it's wrong. Even Christians, well, you know, and, and you know, I'm not going to get into the gifts now, but as the gifts are presented to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's a long section in there. It describes how that, you know, the head can't look down on the foot and say they're not, they're not worthy or they're invaluable. Uh, God considers every part to be valuable. God gives us uh, uh, understanding. So not, not everybody can be the head. Not everybody can be the hand, you know, etc. So even in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul went on to say that does, does, you know, they have the, the list of gifts in a priority order, and prophets are preaching is, is one of the top ones. Does everybody have the gift of, of preaching? No. <laughs> uh, so why does every, why do so many people aspire to that? I can tell you one thing, I didn't. <laughs> I fought the call to preach for a long time, three years in fact. Uh, it's a heavy responsibility to do that. And you, gotta, you can't feel like you're prepared for it. God's got to make you prepared for it. And I learned that the hard way. But what we find is people will think that there are things that are wrong in the Word of God. Even some believers think that's wrong. Take a simple, uh, a simple passage like in 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians. And what we see is the rapture of the church, right? And... <clears throat> Uh, we understand from scriptures the rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation period. There's huge disagreement and division between people over that truth. Huge division. Um, take speaking in tongues and the sign gifts. Huge division among believers in that. And what we understand is when we're told about the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 is they're gifts from God. God gives the gifts. So if God gives the gift, then it's what God gives. So we don't get to determine when it can be used, how it can be used. We need to understand that. 1 Corinthians 13, towards the end of that chapter, tells us that speaking in tongues, for instance, will cease. And it did cease. At the end of the apostolic age, speaking in tongues ceased. 
It was resurrected in the early 1900s by two women out in San Francisco who were going to be super spiritual and started speaking in tongues. And now we got this whole movement around that stuff. So we can't make determinations on that. We have to go back to the scripture. And I'll give you the best example is women preachers. There's a proliferation of what not, not preachers, pastors. There's a proliferation of women pastors. Now, people say, well, women are allowed to preach, and they always go back to the Old Testament. Uh, well, the prescription for women not to teach and usurp authority over men is only applicable in the church. Only in the church. That 1 Timothy chapter 2 only applies to what's going on inside the church. Paul was writing to Timothy, who was pastoring a church over in Cyprus, and said not to have women teach or usurp authority over the men. And it's a prescription that was given, and it's to be done that way in every church. It's just like the qualifications given in, in 1 Timothy and given in Titus are for the qualifications for pastors and deacons and other leaders of the church. Uh, so they don't change uh, over years. They don't change because our society's changed. They've been the same ever since. But there are people that are changing those roles, people changing the roles of who can. So now it's a very popular thing, and one of the most famous excuses for allowing women to preach or pastor a church or preach in the church is that, well, the men aren't doing it, so somebody's got to do it, the women do it. Well, I go back to when they brought the Ark of the Covenant, when David was bringing that into Jerusalem, and there were certain people who were assigned to handle the Ark of the Covenant as they carried it with rods that ran underneath it and come out on each side, and they had men who were designated to carry that. And it was one point in time where it was tipping because somebody fell down, it was tipping, and somebody ran over and grabbed it and saved it. You would think the crowd would shout, Hallelujah! No, God killed him right there because he wasn't supposed to touch it. Um, God, God has his ways, and there, it's right. But we can't change it through our human reasoning because it stands to reason if it's fallen down, we, somebody ought to go get it. Nope. Nope. <laughs> See, that's because we don't trust God. We think something's going to happen to it if it hits the ground. See, that's our human reasoning. God said, don't touch it. Oh, okay. Can't, can't do it. It's, it's, not a, it's, not, <laughs> it's not absolving our, you know, ourselves of some responsibility. You know, we just, it's, just, it's not for us to do. Um, and only those that are called by God to preach the word should be preaching the word. But there's a lot of people who are, what do they call themselves, online ministers now? <laughs> Talk about a proliferation. They're everywhere. But one thing is sure, as we look at this uh, verse 9, they're plain to those who understand and the right to those who find knowledge. And we can't change the process. We need to continue to study and accept it for what it is because it's right. It says at the end of verse 9, and it's right. They, that is the words of my mouth, that is the wisdom of God, is right. Is right. But anytime we think God's wrong, we're wrong. <laughs> We're the ones that are wrong. But there are a lot of people that go their own way in this thing. And most of, there's a lot of those people this day and time who go back to Paul and say, well, I did what Paul did. I sort of got myself to myself, and I just sort of studied the Scriptures on my own, and now I understand it, and God gave me the knowledge, and so I'm right about this thing. And it's like, you know, that is not right. You have taken things out of context. Because, see, we don't know. We don't know this whole thing from cover to cover. It takes time, but more than time and effort, it takes God giving us the enablement to preach the Word. That's what's important. And so there are people that are preaching the Word who don't have the enablement. And so what they're saying isn't necessarily right. And so it causes confusion in the church, a thing which Paul resisted heavily when he went in and tried to set the record straight everywhere he went to preach that which was right in the church. Now, the last point we find in verses 10 to 21 and that's the value of wisdom. Wisdom's value. We saw wisdom's character. It's right. It's righteous, uh, if you will, in these last few verses. And in verses 10 to 21, the value of God's wisdom. This is where we ought to pay attention, particularly. And, the, and to understand the value of it, first in verse 10, we must receive it. We must receive instructions, a word for wisdom. Receive my instruction, that is my wisdom. And what is it juxtaposed with? Silver and gold. Silver and gold. 
I keep hearing the commercial on TV, you know, put all your money in silver and gold. Don't put it in a bank. Put it in silver and gold. And those commercials always have silver and gold that's not just the solid silver and gold. It's mixed with something. Covered, stamped, looks beautiful, nice attractive packaging. Package to sell because it's not as valuable as they propose it is. <laughs> and don't put all your money in that, I would say. But one thing that is more important, and we understand the value of silver and gold. I don't think anybody uh, misunderstands the value of silver and gold. It's important. It's valuable. But there's something that's much greater, and it says, receive. But listen to this. Receive is a command. Receive my instruction. Receive it. Because see, what we do is, when we read the Word of God and we skip over some things, those things that we, don't, we consider to be less important and don't spend a lot of time on, we don't try to understand it, has some important truth. We didn't receive it because we didn't consider it to be valuable through our reasoning mind, which is fallible. And so we reason that to be true. We say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I like this one here. <laughs> you know, and we, that's why I don't, I don't put a lot of emphasis on people say, well, my favorite verse of Scripture is, right? My go-to verse is, all of Scripture is important. And I think when something becomes valuable to us, then that means other things are less valuable. Uh, and I don't, I don't look at it that way, you know? And a lot of people use Philippians 4.13, you know, that, you know, God's going to strengthen me and I can do whatever I want to do. Uh, well, no, not really, because you didn't read 1 John where it says, only as God's will allows you to do that, right? It's got to be according to God's will. So, but we think that uh, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. We can't do all things. And although the verse is, means what it says, we've taken that out of context. The context is that that which is according to God's will, if, God, if that's God's will and we pray about that thing, we can do God's will. And so if, 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 if we prayed up, studied up, and we pray about that, and it doesn't come to pass, you see, we try to impose our will over God's will, particularly in the area where it's our relatives or friends or loved ones who are sick or are dying. And that's when we really get serious about it. And I got in trouble in other churches that I pastored because I go on visitation and I pray, and at the end of the prayer I say, Lord, please heal so-and-so. Uh, and that's, that's our request but we submit it to your will. And boy, people don't like that. They don't like it that we submit it to God's will. They just want the person healed. They forget about God's will. I want them healed. Uh, and, you know, we always submit. Jesus said, I, I came not to do my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. And we always ought to be about Because if we, if we you know, everybody has a loved one. And if, if people who, who are believers thought that they could just heal, get every God to heal every one of their friends and family and loved ones and acquaintances, nobody would ever die. That's not God's plan. It's not God's plan. You know, God says he gives us uh, three score and ten, 70 years, plus or minus, and that's where we are today, you know, some, what, you know, thousands of years later. We're still in the same place, despite all the advances in medicine and all those things. You know, lifespan is not much different. In fact, if you want to look back, you know, Methuselah was 900 and some, right? So, you know, it's sin. It's sin that causes death. And remember, even though we get saved by the grace of God, we still pay the consequences, and the consequences of sin is death. We understand that the, that the offering of Christ's sacrifice at the cross was sufficient to save us from our sins and wipe away all of our sins consequences were never wiped away. Consequences aren't wiped away. Now, the first, not first time, but when we were saved by the grace of God, sin and its consequences are gone, forgotten. Now, 1 John 1, 8 says we're still going to sin even after we're saved, and we commit acts of sin, and those can be forgiven, and we can be cleansed according to 1 John 1, 9, but those consequences still, or those sins still have consequences in our life even though we've been forgiven of that sin. So we just think that we can escape when we can't. We sort of get it wrong. And, you know, we need to pray in accordance with God's will. We need to understand that we can't have our own way in the Scriptures. So when we get down to that level and that point where we're not so haughty and proud about where we are, we think we're somebody because we're saved by the grace of God and I can do all things through Christ Jesus. We can only do what God wills us to do. <laughs> 
So we pray in accordance with God's will. Every time we pray, we should pray in accordance with the will of God because that's ultimately what allows our prayers to be approved is if it's in accordance with the will of God. So, and by the way, uh, you spend that much time talking about it, we ought to turn to a scripture, the scripture that tells us that. It's one of them. There are other places that give us that. Made very plain in 1 John chapter 5. Um, uh, uh, look in verse 14, 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence. See, this, we have confidence in God. We're saved by the grace of God. Our full confidence is in Him. He's our hope. He's our stay. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything, anything according to His will, He hears us. He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. But if you look back at, um, um, uh, excuse me, at the end of verse 14, it says, If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. According to His will. So there are scriptures that tell us we ask and we shall receive. That is true. But what we ask must be conditioned by the will of God. It's got to be. And if it's not, it doesn't mean it's a worthless prayer. It just means that God's under no obligation to do that. And if it's not God's will, why would He want to do it if it runs against His will? Right? So we, we pray for some things, and those things happen. We pray for other things that they don't happen. What do we do? We say, I don't know why God didn't answer that prayer. Well, it must not have been according to His will. We know why. Well, it might also be something else, and that is that we've asked in vain because we have some known sin in our life, and it's like, you know, it's like taking the Lord's Supper in, in, in vain, you know, where according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where people actually die from you know, not having confessed sins before they to partake of the Lord's Supper. They've actually died of that. Many people have been made sick because of that. Um, so we can't just do what we want to do. It's all got to be in accordance with God's Word, and that's where the wisdom and the increase in wisdom becomes so important to us. So back to Proverbs 8 and verse 10, uh, where we look at wisdom's value. It says, Receive my instruction, not silver uh, and knowledge, uh, and knowledge rather than choice gold. So the, the key here is wisdom is the key thing. In fact, we, heard, we read earlier in Proverbs as we studied that get wisdom because wisdom is the principal thing. Literally, it's preeminent. Why? Because Christ is preeminent and Christ is the Word. So God's Word is preeminent. Uh, it, is, it should be the most prominent thing in our life. So in verse 11, it says, for, for is the reason why uh, wisdom is, is so valuable even much more valuable than the material wealth in the world. The greatest of those being perhaps precious metals. So in verse 11, 4, wisdom is better than rubies. You see precious stones here. We saw silver and gold in the previous verse. But wisdom is better than rubies. And all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. So whatever you can think of that have great value, it can't be compared to wisdom can't be compared. Take the thing that you consider to be the most valuable. Can't be compared to wisdom. We're told that plainly, if you will, uh, because those things are incomparable to wisdom. So then we get back to the first person here uh, in verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. Uh, and this is really like shrewdness. It's being able to, to operate with a keen and discerning eye and mind and heart to know the difference in what's right and what's wrong and to make good decisions. It's that discerning spirit of God um, uh, that gives us that shrewdness, if you will. So I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. And so this is the value of wisdom. We get prudence with it. And so we see this is a, this is a, um, this is a, um, a benefit, if you will, of wisdom. And we get prudence. And we find out knowledge of witty inventions. And, you know, crafty is the term witty inventions, craftiness, if you will. And we're able to find out. The words find out means discretion. 
So the devil is deceitful and wicked above all things, right? And so we know that he's trying to deceive us. He is the great deceiver. He's stronger than we are only through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. As we're filled with the Holy Spirit, can we really discern that the devil's the one behind this? And uh, because he appears as the most attractive alternative to us. He knows how to do that. He's so witty. So, but with the wisdom of God, we find that stuff out. We understand it. And that's discretion and it's discernment. And then in verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord does what? It produces wisdom. We study that in Proverbs 1, 7. It's the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning, the inception or starting point of wisdom. And so the fear of the Lord is used as a synonym here for wisdom. And wisdom is to hate evil. In fact, when we confess a sin, a sin is wickedness or evil, iniquity that we, a transgression that we have committed. And so we need to, we need to, um, because it's evil, we need to go to the Lord and we need to go with a confession, a confession, not ask God to forgive us. We ask, we tell God, we confess to God that we sinned and what the sin is. And we have to take the same position. That's what confession means in 1 John 1, 9. Confession we means take the same position against the sin that God has. God hates it. We saw that back in Proverbs 6. God hates evil. So we really haven't confessed the sin unless we take the position that we hate that kind of sin. And of course in 1 John chapter 3 it tells us the difference between the child of God and the unbeliever is that a child of God will commit acts of sin but they won't practice sin as a, as a practice of life. Their life, uh, yeah, we're going to sin because we're not perfect. We're still in a carnal flesh. But the unbeliever has no issues with committing sin <laughs> because they haven't put faith in Christ and they're really lack and void of understanding because that comes through the beginning point, the fear of the Lord, and they don't have that. So that's why you see a lot of uh, arrogance towards that. So the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, hate pride, hate arrogance, and the evil way. That is anything uh, that is uh, sinful, uh, and way implies necessarily behavior, whether it's actions or words or deeds or thoughts. Um, so we will hate pride and arrogance in the evil way, whether it's in our life or somebody else's life, and the froward or the perverse mouth, do I hate. So wisdom hates those things. We've got to take the same position God does when we confess our sins, or it's not true confession. And when we confess those sins, 1 John 1 tells us that God not only forgives us of that sin, but he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The beauty of God's grace. Uh, you know, Paul said, God's grace is sufficient for me. And it is. The word sufficient means it is sufficient, period. It's, it's, it's all that's needed. It's all that's necessary. Now, in verse 14, continuing, if you will, the value of wisdom, uh, counsel is mine. So we see when we get wisdom, we get perfect counsel. That's perfect counsel. It's the counsel of God. Counsel is mine. And sound wisdom. Sound wisdom is that which is whole or pure. You know, our body is made whole. Like when, when, the, when the people who had some malady were healed, they were instantly healed by God and made whole or sound. And it's the same thing, if you will, with counsel. Counsel or wisdom that is sound is wisdom that is pure, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's all right. It's righteousness. Uh, counsel is mine, and sound wisdom, I am understanding. I have strength. And this strength is the strength, moral strength, to do what's right and resist evil. James says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The, the problem is, according to James chapter 1, we entertain the evil instead of resisting it. In our mind, we sort of dwell or think about it or ponder it or, you know, what pleasure it might bring us or what benefit it might bring us. Um, you know, the boss comes and says, well, you need, to, you need to lie on this form here and backdate this thing. And you know it's the wrong thing to do. You know the boss will be happy if I do it and I really please the boss. Maybe you'll give me a raise, right? Uh, no, not right. According to God, it's wrong, and so you don't do it. It doesn't matter if it costs you your job, if it costs you your marriage, if it costs you all your material possessions. It doesn't matter. The thing is that we have the strength through the wisdom of God uh, to be able to do the right thing, the righteous of God, if you will, and, if you will, to resist doing evil or resist the devil um, who brings us that temptation. Because God never tempts us. God tempts nobody. He tries us. 
He tries us in our faith. He did that with Job. He, he broached the subject of Job to the devil, and the devil, oh, okay. And, you know, devil accused God of, you know, harboring him with, uh, you know, uh, 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 the inability to touch him. And God says, you can do everything, you just can't take his life. And boy, he took everything but his life, if you've read that story. So counsel is mine, sound wisdom, and by me in verse 15, the value of wisdom, kings reign, princes decree justice. So we're talking about from the throne and from the legal bench, if you will, as a judge. By me in verse 16, princes rule, kings reign, princes rule. They all have their place in the hierarchy of, um, of uh, leadership, if you will, and nobles all the judges of the earth, all the judges of the earth. So um, that's really where Solomon got his wisdom. He said, I want to be able to judge my people. God says, you can have anything you want. Solomon, we started out with that. We started, started the book of Proverbs. We went back and studied that where Solomon got his wisdom. And Sol God asked Solomon, You'll give what, I'll give you whatever you want. And he said, I want the discernment to be able to know right, in, right from wrong and judging my people. Um, and, and that's what God gave him. It's amazing. And he had more wisdom than anybody else on earth. That's what he wanted. I think we just want the wrong thing sometimes. Uh, and we, you know, we say we want it, but there's still things going on in the background of our mind and heart, and we're into other things that are actually considered to be more valuable than the wisdom. <clears throat> And the way we live our life and the way, the way we attend to the Word of God versus the things of this world, compare, comparatively in our life, will dis distinguish a uh, love for the Word or a love for the world. So princes rule uh, and nobles and even all the judges of the earth, uh, you know, wisdom allows people to be good leaders and good judges. In verse 17, I love those who love me. Amen. Um, you know, God loves us. First, uh, first John chapter four, the scriptures tell us God is love. In fact, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And everyone who's a true child of God through faith in Christ, by the grace of God, been saved uh, <clears throat> and given an eternal inheritance, uh, they do love God. Because they have God in them who is love. And so love, and love is one of the, the fruit of the Spirit, if you will, is love. Peace, joy, love. Love is one of those. So God loves us. Wisdom loves us. I love those who love me, and those who seek me early shall find me. And it's <clears throat> really that <clears throat> early points more to the importance uh, of, of wisdom over other things in our life. Some people term that as first thing in the day. Some people term it as being earlier in your life you do that. And I think it's just more about uh, you'll, you're, you really consider that, uh, fulfilling that need in your life as a priority over filling other needs in your life or other wants or desires. <clears throat> it's a matter of priority. So in verse 18, riches and honor are with me. Get that? Get wisdom, not silver or gold, not, not rubies, but riches and honor are with me. With what? They're with wisdom. Verse 12 says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. I am riches and honor. <clears throat> Yea, durable riches. Because, see, what? And righteousness. Some people think, well, riches, yeah, yeah, I'm rich in wisdom, but. It's durable. You know, we don't consider that which is intangible to be durable. God does. The wisdom that we get from the Lord, because remember that Jesus told his disciples that as you go and you serve, that when you get in a position before authorities and you're challenged by the court, that when you need to respond to that in a godly manner, God will bring it to your memory what to say. The Holy Spirit will give you what you need to say. So it's that which is, comes by cherishing wisdom, receiving wisdom, and it doesn't mean that we necessarily remember that or came up with it, but God delivers us from the situation through wisdom because wisdom is durable <clears throat> and uh, it's righteous in every way. So my fruit, 
Uh, fruit is a word that's used for a yield, you know, the fruit of the field. If you are a farmer and you have crops, it's the yield of your property. Uh, in a life where you're not a farmer, it's called benefits, right? Or the, it could be our value, the things that are, that are cherishable by us to a high degree. My fruit, wisdom, the fruit of wisdom is better than gold. We see that same comparison, and with silver as well, it says, yea, then fine gold, the best quality gold you can find. Wisdom is what? Better. And it says, my revenue, and my revenue than choice silver. Revenue is that benefit which comes from wisdom. So the benefit of the wisdom of God operating in our lives effectively through God's power and strength and enablement by the Holy Spirit is better than even choice silver. In fact, wisdom here <clears throat> uh, takes on the first person, uh, per, continues first person. We see my there and me in verse 18, me in verse 17, and verse 16 and verse 15. So, and in verse 14, it says, I am understanding. It goes all the way back to verse 12, where it says, I wisdom. So, <clears throat> in verse 20, the scripture says, I, that is wisdom, lead in the way of righteousness. Because wisdom is righteousness. We just saw that uh, two verses prior. And so, the wisdom of God will never lead us down a wrong path. Now, if we try to take and mix the wisdom of God with our understanding, and we add our reasoning to it, which so many people do, uh, we've introduced error. And when we introduce error, because if, if our thinking is opposite, because the righteousness of God will, do, will deliver us and give us perfect counsel, and if we just take some of our wisdom that's apart from the understanding we receive from God, because we reason it, maybe it's something we heard from somebody else. Maybe it's an experience, remember, from somebody else. Maybe an earlier experience in our life, and we sort of say, well, I did this before and it worked. No, we just need to rely on the wisdom of God. We've got to trust it. It's all about trust and faith. Um, so I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice. I lead. God will lead us. Uh, and, you know, Jesus told his disciples that. He says, I'm, I'm going to, uh, he says, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will leave you another comforter who will guide you into all truth. And so it's that capability that God gives to us. It's the, uh, it's the um, spiritual competence, if you will, and under the leadership of wisdom. So this section sums up in verse 21, <clears throat> why is the uh, thing that the, that gives us, and that is the reason why, uh, all, of, all of these uh, characteristics of the value of wisdom have been given here. And we see that, you know, the sound wisdom, we see the strength, we see leadership and judging, and, you know, we see honor and riches and uh, all of these things, and, and being led by the Holy Spirit to do the right thing, even to resist the devil. Verse 21, why? That I may cause, cause... Those who love me, remember uh, that he started this section out, if you will. I love, I love those who love me, right? He said that I may cause those who love me to inherit substance. And I will fill their treasures. Treasuries is a, a term we use today. But <clears throat> what is God going to give us? <laughs> um, now this is not. Uh, matter of fact, every time, every situation, every person thing. Proverbs is primarily a generality uh, that is typical. It's not, it's not atypical, it's typical, and it's not for everybody. Uh, if you take a look at, um, at Paul, Paul didn't have a treasury that was full. <laughs> he didn't have a treasury that was full. And... Um, uh, and if you take a look at Stephen, Stephen didn't even live a full life. That is a fairly young man, full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, we understand. But he, did, he didn't have a treasury that was full. But what God says here as a, as a typical scenario that will, that will be for most people who have faith in Christ and who receive the wisdom of God as He intends, and we grow in that wisdom... He says, that I may cause those who love me to inherit substance. <clears throat> uh, 
And uh, the interesting thing is that this word that's given as substance here is translated other places in the, New, in the Old Testament as are, A-R-E, be, uh, was, were, shall be, there is, things like that. It's the only time it's given as substance, but it's the only time this word is used in that way. But it's obviously translated that way from the, from the Hebrew to give us that understanding that what's intended here is substance. And um, substances mean things. It means material things. Uh, and it says, I, I will fill, because we understand at the end of the verse, and I will fill their treasuries um, and their treasures. And the obvious thing here is one of the benefits of wisdom, and we can look back to Solomon, who wrote this. Solomon didn't ask for a dime or a pen or a mere pittance. He didn't even ask for that. He said, I want wisdom. I could get anything he wanted. God said, you tell me what you want, I'll give it to you. He asked for wisdom. The, he asked for discernment, be able to, which is wisdom. Be able to tell the difference right and wrong so I can judge my people. That's what he asked for. He didn't ask for substance. What did God give him? He not only gave him wisdom in the greatest degree that he's given to mankind, but he also gave him substance to the greatest degree that anybody had. He was the richest man, at least at that point in time, ever on top side of earth. And he was rich and wealthy. He didn't ask for that, but that's what God gave him. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody gets wealthy, because they put their faith in God. Now, there are some health and wealth preachers out there who will tell me, you plant a seed in this ministry, and God's going to give you a hundredfold, right? I mean, they, just, they, 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 they really play on the emotions of people and in the condition they're in. So there are people that have, don't have much, and they give $10 thinking they'll get 1000 You know, I mean, it's just the people will do that. And they reap in all this money coming in, and they're making merchandise of the people that are uh, participating in their ministry. That's not what God intends here. The intention is, put your focus on the spiritual things. Get wisdom. With that, get understanding. Get knowledge. The ability to lead and guide and do and be right in all that you do. Put your focus there. God is the one who will bless you with material things, wealth, whatever that is. God is the one who determines whether you get that or not. Don't put your focus on accumulating the wealth. Accumulate the wisdom. Let God take care of the rest. I want to close with a passage over in Proverbs 24. And we'll spend more time on it when we get there towards the end of the book. <clears throat> but in Proverbs 24, uh, look at verse 3. <clears throat> it says, through wisdom. How? By wisdom. All right? And all you're getting, get wisdom. Through wisdom is an house builded. Now a house here can mean a literal house. It can also mean a family who lives in the house. It can also mean an enterprise, maybe a business or a venture that you might be in uh, because God understands that we work for a living because God says we need to work for a living to provide for our family. That's God's instruction. We need to work. And, we, and then we'll provide for our family. So we, we, an enterprise is that kind of work or whatever that work might entail, no matter how small or how big it is, if you will. So a house could be that. A house could even be a dynasty, if you will. So much like Solomon was a king, right? And God blessed him through his kingship. But through wisdom is a house built. How is our house built? Through wisdom. And by understanding, what is that? Wisdom, it is established. So our life, we could really call this house literally our life. Our life is built and established on the wisdom that we receive from God. Verse 4 says, and by knowledge, we see, if you will, wisdom in verse 3. We see understanding in verse 3. We see knowledge in verse 4. Those are the three words that are used synonymously throughout Proverbs for the word of God. Wisdom. And by knowledge or wisdom shall the chambers of what? Chambers of our house, that is the aspects of our life, in a literal house, it would be the rooms be filled with furniture, right? Uh, and by wisdom or, or knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. <laughs> so uh, literally the house could be a house or anything much bigger than that. And God fills that life, if you will, as he deems appropriate. And the important thing about the riches is this. Don't seek riches. It's clear in our study tonight. It's clear throughout the Word of God. Don't seek riches. Seek wisdom. And with wisdom, and that's what, the, that's, God loves us. 
And we see that, that wisdom loves those who love Him. So when we love God, God loves us. God is wisdom. Wisdom loves us because we love wisdom. Let God take care of the material things of this world. Rely on Him. Trust in Him. There are people out there trying to cheat and swindle and do everything else in order to try to accumulate. Rely on God. Because wisdom is going to hold our, we're going to get through wisdom, we're going to be able to hold our course and do that which is right, that which is righteous. And we're going to have wisdom as our preeminent focus uh, because wisdom is God. And through the wisdom, we're going to be able to, to run our course through this life. And the provisions that God will give are what He's going to give. He may bless us to the point where He'll fill those. And typically, He'll provide abundantly. And that's the, when it says filled, it's abundant filling of the, of the rooms in the house, is what He calls it, in the aspects of our life. God will fill that. And we understand, I know a lot of people who, have, you know, they, I'm, a, I'm an example of it myself, but, and maybe you are too, where God, I, I remember I was, I was from a, a nowhere family and nowhere in this world and literally lived with people I didn't even know. That's, was my, that was my bringing up. I was actually cast out of state to live at a, at a, at a dormitory school in my seventh grade and nobody wanted me. I understand that's, that was sort of the beginning of this trek. And I bounced from place to place. I've lived in 13 different states and went to 12 different high school, uh, 12 different schools before I graduated from 12th grade. Um, and the thing is that despite all of that, despite all of that, God prepared my heart that at the age of 30, I put my faith in Christ. God finally got my attention. And when he did, it's just amazing what God did after that because I gave my heart to the Lord it's not me, it's what God does for us. And whether I'd have been a pauper or a king or where I am, it would have made no difference to me because the money and the material things are not what's important. What's important is to get wisdom. And when we get that wisdom, what we, what we accumulate, what the Lord gives us by way of accumulation, what the Lord gives us, we have responsibility because God wants us to be a good steward of what He's given us because guess what? It's not ours. It all belongs to God. And, and so we're a steward. A steward is one who manages a property, right? So what we get is that which God gives us to manage. And so we need to manage it according to the wisdom of God, to do the right thing and to be righteous in what we do. So the management of that is all part of our experience in pleasing and satisfying God in all that we do. And so a person who loves God is going to love Him in that way. And so this passage is for those who love God they're doing God's will, His beck and call. Doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means that's the course of our life and that's the thrust of our life and that's what's important to us. When we do that, God takes care of filling or not filling the coffers. And we don't worry about it. The Scripture says, Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication make your request be made known unto God. And then we turn it over to Him. No anxiety, no worry. Carefree because God's taken our issues Verse 7 in Philippians 4 says, And then the peace of God that passes understanding will keep our hearts. And so we're satisfied wherever we are. Paul said it well, and we'll close with this thought from Philippians as well. He says, No matter what state you find yourself in, therewith be content. Be content. Because, you know, there's a whole section of Scripture Paul wrote to the Corinthians and reminded them of the complaining that the Israelites did in the wilderness. God hates complaining. And what we learn, Paul told us that uh, through the scriptures, which is what God tells us, is that our, our ability, if you will, to be content under all circumstances is a learned capability provided by God. You have to learn that. You have to learn it. Paul said, I have learned to be content in whatever state. Because you know what? I didn't used to be content in whatever state I was in, but I am now. It doesn't matter what the situation is. And if it's all gone today, that's okay. It's, it's all gone. So be it. Uh, I did wake up one morning. Um, it was, uh, uh, I don't know, it was probably uh, eight or nine years ago. I woke up and, uh, you know, we have these uh, investment plans associated with where we work. And I got up one morning and I checked my balance and it was zero. <laughs> it was zero. And... Uh, my wife got all panicky about it, and I said, well, you know, uh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. 
I said, we're, we're going to see, we're going to find out why it's gone, because <laughs> it shouldn't have been gone. And there was some mistake that was made, and they corrected it. So, but it was not to worry. It doesn't matter. But, you know, the Lord does give, and the Lord takes away. We just need to be content, whatever the situation is. When our daughter went missing one time, literally missing for three days, we had no clue where she was. We didn't know if she's dead in the street somewhere or, you know, what? Taken out of the country, we had no clue for three days. And uh, everybody in the family was all panicky about it and says, why aren't you upset about this? I said, because I've got peace that passes understanding because I can be content in this situation because my trust is not in my capability to find her, but in God's capability to return her. I said, my will is submitted to his will. I've asked God to return her. And I said, he's the one that can get it done. I don't know how. So we get a call the fourth day from a police officer on the side of the road down in West Palm Beach, Florida. So we've got your daughter here on the side of the road. I said, you hold her right there. I'll be on a plane in about an hour and I'll be right down there. <laughs> but, you know, the Lord provided, the Lord took care of it. And, you know, it's, uh, and whether he had taken care of it that, to, to that satisfaction or not, Still be content. Still be content. Because uh, we don't deserve... What is it that we deserve? Nothing. We don't deserve anything. Uh, God is the one who gives us every good and perfect gift, according to what James wrote in the first chapter. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And kids are a perfect gift, and God gave them to us. And sometimes we think that we did it. That's where we got to come out of the equation. Once we get ourselves out of the equation, we're thankful for whatever we have and wherever we are. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for what you've given us tonight uh, by way of wisdom and understanding as you have guided and directed us through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit to enable us to know and to receive um, and to agree uh, and, to, and to put into action that which you've given to us that, Lord, we put our trust in you, which means we put our trust in your wisdom. May we always be focused to do the right thing according to your word, knowing that the outcome <clears throat> may not be what we want, but it'll be what you want in our life. Because know that all things work together for good to those who love you. Father, we just thank you and praise you. Ask you to keep us safe as we make our way into the family tonight and then around and about and come back on Sunday. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.